Yeah, a couple of years ago on Halloween, I sort of got into a whole bunch of my stories. Uh, those of you who've been with me for a while will remember uh, it was Halloween, and so I was telling all my creepy ghost stories and monster stories and all that stuff. Uh, and I have had requests to repeat this. Last Halloween, I had a request, and I, I didn't. I just wasn't in the mood. Uh, but today's show is one of Bill's stories. It only remotely has anything to do with gardening. Not creepy, but interesting. Yeah, my uh, son Alex. He he called me up from Madison, Wisconsin, the other day. Um, you know, we talked about the, the riots and everything else going on. But, uh, oh, as things wound on, I started telling a couple of my stories, I guess. And yeah, my son likes hearing it every once in a while. So he, he listened. And then it brought to mind a story about iridescent sow bugs out in... Uh, in the UK, they call these things woodlouse, woodlice. Um, in the U.S., we tend to call them either sow bugs or there's one variety we call pill bug, too, the one that rolls up in a little ball when you tap them. You know, roly polies, they call them that, too. Anyway, uh, they're little crustaceans. They're actually in the crab lobster family, these guys, and we get them in the gardens. I'm sure everybody out there knows about the sow bug, uh, yes, especially in the compost. Um, they will chew into a piece of soft fruit occasionally, though. They're not real big at damaging garden vegetables. More uh, uh, decomposers. But they, they will. They will. So, the sow bug <laughs> is as close as we're getting in this story today to the garden. Yeah, so I was discussing things with my son, and um, I don't really quite remember what brought it up. But... I asked him, hey, have I ever told you the story about blue glowing sow bugs? Uh, so I said, no, I don't think you have. Uh, I said, really? Well, okay, uh, would you like to hear it? He says, oh, sure. All right. So, so I let him have the story. <clears throat> um, it's been a mystery for about 50 years in my life. And... Uh, well, it turned out, and not like having a smart kid, my, my son actually helped me solve a 50-year-old mystery. Uh, it was very cool. So, to get started here, um, my son's name is Alex. And uh, Alex, he's named after one of the, the best friends I have ever had in this world. Another man named Alex. Um, and uh, we were br blood brothers, you know, we did a lot together. And uh, he's deceased now, Alex is no longer with us, and I do miss him. But, yeah, we did a whole lot of stuff together. And um, one of the things was, uh, way back around 1971, it would be, um, I was running a moving and hauling company in, in, in Chicago area, making a lot of money. I and all my friends, drinking good wine, you know. And, well, in those days, it just was starting to get a little too rich for my blood, I think. And my friend Alex came up to me one day and said, Hey, Bill, I'm going to ride my bicycle to Phoenix, Arizona. Come with? Well, Alex, I don't even have a bike. He says, Oh, I got an extra one. I'll sell it to you. Well, hey, what the heck, you know? I mean... I'd kind of been living high on the hog. It sounded to me like that might not be a bad idea. Let's hit the road, ride bicycles. So we spent a week or two preparing, you know, and getting some bags for the bikes and all that stuff. And finally got it all together. And we took off from the northwest suburbs of Chicago and uh, headed southwest towards the great state of Arizona. Uh, we had a, a friend of ours that we'd gone to school with was in college down there in Scottsdale. And so we were riding down to see John. <laughs> That's about all there was to it, you know. No major point in any of this. It was a fantastic trip. It was fabulous. Um, you know, moving across the United States at the speed that a horse moves roughly, 
was such an educational experience for me. And if I can't, if there's just one thing to say about it, the people in this country are wonderful. Yeah, yeah, we we had made so many friends and got so many breakfasts and free beer and you name it. You know, it was just it was really wonderful. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that we did this. Anyway, by the time we got to Kansas. <laughs> We realized that that prairie wind howls all day long. It just blew right in our faces. And it got to the point that it was exhausting us. And so Alex and I finally decided, well, we're going to go ahead and, and turn our shifts around. We're going to ride at night. Because at night, the wind stops. So that seemed logical. And so we started sleeping in cornfields during the daytime. And then uh, pull our bikes out towards sundown, you know, and head on out down the road. Well, of course, when you're riding a bicycle cross-country in the United States, believe me, you're not taking any freeways. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Um, and, you know, even some of the state roads, the two-lane blacktops, can be kind of dangerous. We spent most of our time, really, on, uh, on lettered county roads, a few numbered state roads, but all back highways all the way across the United States of America. Just all back roads, little funky roads through the farms. And, uh, well, since we started riding at night, and we're out there in the prairie in Kansas, and it's really quiet. Oh, my goodness. And it's dark, too. <laughs> and, well, we had an experience of Alex getting sucked in behind a semi into the draft, and he almost got hurt. That thing had him going 60 miles an hour before he actually threw the bike to get out of the draft and hit the ditch. And so we were pretty careful about big trucks after that. And, uh, well, we heard one and saw the lights in the distance. So after a while, we figured, well, yeah, better pull the bikes over. It's going to be here. We don't want to get hit. Then a little tiny county road. And so we pull over. <laughs> no semi. It's probably still 20 miles away. It's so quiet out there. We couldn't tell. Well, we ended up pulling over probably two or three times waiting for that truck. Well, finally the truck come by. And so we're, we're standing out there on the shoulder of the road in the dark, you know. I'm looking around through the prairie, and I'm seeing little blue spots of light. There were glowing blue dots on the ground. They were on the ground, on the shoulder of the road, and in the prairie grasses. And I'm looking at that and going, man, I never seen nothing like that. What is this? So I turn to my buddy Alex, and I go, hey, Alex, you see those blue lights out there? He goes, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, what do you think they are? Say, eh, probably glowworms. No, Alex, they're blue, man. That's cyan. Glowworms are the larva of a firefly, and that, that's a yellowish greenish light. That's the wrong color. He says, Well, I don't know. You know, so we take the headlight of the bike, shine it down on the ground, and boy, oh boy. I mean, literally, millions of sow bugs. Millions of them just swarming all over the ground. And they all glowed phosphorescent blue. Now, I am familiar with crustaceans glowing blue under geologist black lights. In Arizona, we'd use portable geologist black lights to hunt scorpions around water holes. You know, in the night, because if in the night, if you put a black light on a on a deadly Arizona scorpion, Sonora scorpion, they phosphoresce blue, uh, and so they're really easy to find. You can pair of chopsticks, pick them up, put them in a can, you know. And well, they were worth pretty good money in those days. I don't do stuff like that anymore, but there was a a business in harvesting those at a point. So I did have that one experience in my life of a blue crustacean, but. Otherwise, I'd never heard of such a thing. I'd never seen such a thing. Um, it was a mystery. Anyway, so we go on pedaling off through the night, and in the distance we see some lights around a truck stop at a crossroads. And uh, it has a name. It was called Yates Center, 
was the name of the town. It's hardly a town I, that I could see. Mostly it's a truck stop, a crossroad, and farms. And, uh, well, as we come up to the truck stop, there are insects whirling around the lights in the truck stop. Just cyclonic. Every light has this horde of insects. It appeared none of them were actually meat eaters. They were all um, plant-eating bugs, grasshoppers, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, and they were just everywhere. I've never seen so many insects in the air in my life. And we pull into this truck stop. You know, we're thinking maybe we'd get a bite to eat or something. Uh, it's a weird scene. This is 1 o'clock in the morning. And all across the parking lot of the truck stop, the farmers in bib overalls, just like this pair, standing around there with a wheat straw in their mouth, you know. I'd say that the youngest one in the lot was probably 65 years old. Most of them probably heading on up towards 80. They were pretty much all retired farmers at 1 o'clock in the morning, standing around the truck stop in small groups, talking story. They weren't doing anything. I mean, they just all they just standing around out there in the middle of the night, just talking to each other. I don't know, I think it's insomnia in Yates Center or what goes on there. Anyway, you know, this is a pretty strange scene. Alex and I pull up next to a friendly-looking old guy in a pair of overalls and start a conversation with him. After a while, I thought to broach the question. You know, as I was coming into town, I saw these sow bugs that phosphorescent blue. You know much about that? Well, the old guy looked at me, kind of winks a little bit, brushes six or seven grasshoppers off his shoulder, pulls off his hat, and knocks two more off, you know, puts it back on his head and goes, well, you know, bugs around here do one thing one year, then they won't do it again for another 50. He says, you can never tell. It's crazy bugs around here. Look at the sky. There's bugs <laughs> everywhere. I said, yeah, you're right. This is about the weirdest bug place I have ever been. So we ended up riding off into the night on a blue glowing mystery. So then I spent nearly the last 50 years speaking with college entomologists, people who study bugs and such. I have yet to meet a Christologist. That's a guy who studies crustaceans. Okay, not a guy that makes bread dough. No, a crustologist is a is a crustacean scientist. I've never met one, so I couldn't ask the, of uh, the, the question. You know, do saw bugs ever glow blue? But I did ask a lot of people involved in insects, and I get complete negatives. I went through books. The problem mostly was that it appears I was sort of barking up the wrong tree. Because of what I knew about scorpions, I assumed that the sow bug maybe had a form that had a natural phosphorescence. See? Well, that was the case. As I told this story to my son, you know, he listened to it, and then he goes Googling and Googling and looking here and looking there and looking there. And finally, after 50 years, he answers my question. What I saw were sow bugs that were infected with an invertebrate incandescent virus number 31. Okay, y'all dealing with COVID-19, right? This is a virus. It's a phosphorescent virus. It attacks uh, various forms of crustacean land organisms, you know, like the pill bug, the sow bug, and so on. Uh, it's also known as the uh, isopod incandescent virus. And so basically what I witnessed was millions and millions of sick sow bugs that the the virus that they take on is phosphorescent it's not the bug and so my son answered my question for me i've been waiting for that answer for a long time i've asked a lot of highly educated people that question and it's it's finally been solved that's what i like about stories you know it's you notice that sometimes a story begins before the beginning and doesn't end long after the end. This is one that starts 50 years back and before. 
continues and continues and continues and finally 50 years later this story finally has a conclusion that we know what it was all about i love stories like that that take forever to see what the meaning and the answer is what's the uh, you know the moral of this story well the moral of this story is be careful for viruses you could start glowing <laughs> Aloha, Anglos. Thanks for listening.